Hello, I'm Nurse Cam from Heyday Clinic, joined today by Dr. Jim, also from Heyday Clinic. And today we're going to be diving into terpenes. So just a quick uh, terpene 101. Um, Jim, do you want to start this off? What is a terpene? Look, I'll start this off, Cam, but I know that you have a special interest in, in terpenes. So I'll give a basic um, a basic answer, I guess, around what, what terpenes are, to my understanding. And then you can give a, a more in-depth ex explanation because I think you really are the, the expert when it comes to terpenes. So from my understanding, terpenes are the aromatic compounds um, that are found within the cannabis plant, but they're also found within a lot of other naturally occurring sort of substances. They have many different purposes for their existence within these plants. They can be there to help with um, attracting uh, appropriate um, appropriate sort of animals or insects to help with pollination. They can be there as a protective mechanism for these plants. They have many different sort of uh, medical uses and can have a vast array of different sort of effects with it within the body as well. And they, in cannabis, they're what gives it its unique and complex sort of aroma. And cannabis is very unique in that it does have such a uh, an abundant bouquet mm. of of terpenes that can really provide very different sort of smells, but also therapeutic outcomes based on on the sort of on on the array of those terpenes. But you, would you be able to give us a better understanding of exactly what what terp terpenes are and their makeup? Yeah. Well, look, you've done a fantastic job within the plant. Terpenes are responsible for the aroma. They're also responsible for protecting that plant against a, a variety of environmental stressors, um, mm. protecting them from certain predators as insecticides and in attracting pollinators. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to the aroma, the aroma of a certain plant is not just that plant. Like if you look at a rose, the smell of a rose is not just rose. It's actually a combination of citronellol, geraniol, linalool, farnesol, apinine, b-pinene, limonene, camphene, beta-caryophyllene, and a host of other terpenes. So the same goes with cannabis varieties. Chemovars are generally named based upon their terpene composition, upon their bouquet. So in addition to creating those beautiful aromas, uh, terpenes are widely considered to be the effects drivers of cannabis mm. chemovars. So for a simple analogy, we'll use a car. Um, if THC might be the gas, CBD might be the brakes, and then terpenes are the steering wheels. Or potentially the terpene profile is the genre and the THC is the volume. So it's really, really critical that you observe and assess various terpene profiles because that's going to be a massive indicator of what the effects from that plant will be. So where can terpenes be found? Well, absolutely everywhere, all around you. Uh, they're extremely abundant. They're found all throughout nature. And the same exact terpenes found within cannabis are found in other plants. So the same molecule, same effects, but sourced from different plants such as, you know, rosemary or lavender, mango, sage, pine trees, eucalyptus, and so on. So you know, if you've ever experienced a drop of lavender on your pillow or a you know, warm florist on a sunny afternoon, you have experienced terpenes. Uh, there's about 20,000 of them that have been identified with around 200 being expressed within the cannabis plant. Um, so within that cannabis plant as well, the, the concentrations of those terpenes, once that cannabis has been cured, is around 2 to 4% of that total weight. So really, we're not talking about massive quantities here. Um, terpenes are highly volatile, and a little goes a long way. It does not take very much um, uh, to experience those, those terpenes. I mean, think about it. If you're walking through the street, and it's a, it's a nice, warm, sun, sunny day, and you smell plants, those you're not ingesting you know high milligram dosages of them just tiny little molecules floating through the air um, so when it comes to uh, you know cannabis terpenes versus other terpenes are they different no no the same terpenes within cannabis are, are the same found in these other plants so linalool which is a terpene regarded for its calming maybe sedative um, or anxiolytic effects is also one of the primary therapeutic agents in lavender. <clears throat> Myrcene uh, is another terpene that's found in abundance within cannabis. It's known for enhancing THC permeability across the blood-brain barrier. It's also found in mangoes, hops, and thyme. When it comes to different cannabis products, you know, do all cannabis products have terpenes? No. Ideally, yes, but in practicality, no. So there are three main types of cannabis formulations. First, we have full spectrum, which are cannabis products extracted with minimal interference to maintain and preserve the original composition of the plant. Full spectrum extracts contain all cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids found naturally in the plant. Next, we have broad spectrum formulations. 
Broad spectrum products are similar to full spectrum, except they've had something removed. Usually this is THC, but not always. So if you are prescribing a broad spectrum because you believe it doesn't contain THC, check the certificate of analysis to make sure. Moving on, we have isolate products. Isolate products contain a single isolated compound such as CBD or THC. Isolates do not contain terpenes or other cannabinoids and are generally considered to lack the efficacy of broad or full spectrum products. So to summarize, we have full spectrum, which preserves as much of the original composition as possible, broad spectrum, which is a full spectrum with something removed, usually THC, but not always, and isolates, which are single isolated compounds. One more formulation that you may come across are terpsilates. Terpsilates are isolates with terpenes added back in. Usually those terpenes aren't from the original cannabis plant, but are instead extracted from other botanicals and added back in. So in conclusion, full spectrum, broad spectrum, and terpsilates are your three cannabis formulations that contain terpenes. Although you may see them, isolates tend to lack the therapeutic efficacy required to treat many conditions. I was going to say, and what, what are some of the particular benefits of, of having these extra terpenes? Within, within the cannabis sort of profiles? Well, so terpenes are, first of all, they're, they're highly bioactive. Um, they have uh, you know, many, many impacts upon our physiology. They <clears throat> uh, exert effects across a, a range of different um, neurotransmitters. And so when you, uh, in addition to that as well, they can temper, uh, enhance, modulate, or mitigate mm. some of the effects from um, THC in particular. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if somebody is particularly sensitive to THC and its psychoactive effects, then you want to be making sure that uh, within their product formulation, uh, you have <clears throat> compounds that are going to help uh, balance out and mitigate those effects. So something like mm. linalool, uh, it's going to have some really strong exertions at the GABA receptors. So mm. if you have uh, some of the anxiety or paranoia that can come along with THC, you might want some linalool to balance out that anxiety, uh, uh, as well as that maybe pinene. So <clears throat> some of the haze or confusion that you might get um, under the influence of THC, well, pinene is something that's going to uh, help to increase the amounts of acetylcholine in the brain as it's a acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And that's going to hopefully provide some more of that clarity in what would otherwise be a cloudy situation. Yeah. yeah and the way, the way that I like to think of it, Cam, is that, you know, the, the, the terpenes often dictate the, the mood of the medicine. And we have this versatile plant that the way that the different components are arranged and in what ratios actually creates quite unique and varied sort of medicine. So you have different functional you know, needs during the day versus during the evening versus at night time. But you may not necessarily want to change the cannabinoid content of a particular product because you find that that sort of, you know, cannabinoid content works well for their condition. But you can change the way that it makes the patient feel by altering the terpene. So you might have something that's more uplifting during the day, more energizing, helps with focus. You might have something more relaxing and sedating uh, at nighttime because that's what you need at those certain times of day. And I do find that the terpenes can really sort of help drive those specific effects that you might might be looking for so they're a very important component to consider and that's a fantastic term is the mood of the medicine it very much is the mood of the medicine because if you have two um you know chemo vars that are both at 19 percent thc and mm. uh, no cbd then you how how could they possibly have these uh you know, these these different effects and provide a mm. starkly different uh, experience to that end user and so you know one of the questions is how do terpenes affect the body in a lot of ways, um, similar to CBD, many terpenes are promiscuous molecules with mixed mechanisms of action. So pinene itself has, you know, 35, maybe 40 different mechanisms through which it works. Um, mm -hmm. You know, terpenes have a lot of weak to moderate actions at various receptors, including GABA receptors, as I mentioned, adenosine receptors, um, 5-HT1A receptors, PPAR receptors, even uh, CB2 receptors in, in one case. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, although we lack the gold standard evidence to support this in many cases, it is believed that the terpenes modulating the effects of cannabinoids such as THC are the contributors to what we call the entourage effect, which is, as you said, you know, the, the mood of the medicine, you know, mm -hmm. the wide range of physiological uh, impacts that a strain can have based upon the components within it. Another question is, you know, do terpenes themselves make you high? No. Certainly, they do not individually make you high. THC still is generally the only thing that is going to do that. However, they can certainly influence that high. Um, you know, we'll take one terpene in particular, myrcene. Myrcene um, is a little companion for THC. It helps it uh, cross a, go across that blood-brain barrier, um, 
providing a, a, a higher uh, concentration of THC hitting those CB1 receptors. And so uh, chemovars really high in mercine are generally thought to be sedative, really potent muscle relaxants. And generally, maybe even that couch lock sensation that people describe is because you know, that mercine has brought more THC across the blood brain barrier than there usually would be. When it comes to side effects, are there side effects from terpenes? Uh, certainly, there's side effects from everything. Um, but, you know, with terpenes, those side effects are uncommon simply because we don't really come into contact with them in concentrations high enough to trigger those side effects. You know, especially if you are uh, using them straight within the plant. If you have indulged enough to experience a side effect from terpenes by, um, you know, vaporizing or using cannabis in some capacity, then you've also reached a point where... Um, you've potentially overdosed significantly on something like THC as well. So you're going to have other things to be concerned about at that point in time. And I, you'd probably even struggle to identify what is doing what. But, you know, individuals with hypersensitivities might get itchy eyes or skin if they come into contact with terpenes, some kind of respiratory disruptions, possible headaches, nausea, or, or vomiting in extreme cases. But, you know, overall... Everyone's going to have a unique set of terpenes that, that work best for them, and that is kind of acquired that knowledge through a bit of trial and error, and a really simple way to identify, you know, if something is going to work for you, if a certain um, chemovar is going to be suitable, is smelling it. If you smell it and you enjoy that smell and you get some kind of nice physiological response, chances are that uh, that product is going to be suitable for you. Whereas uh, some chemovars, you might smell them and it's, it's an off-putting smell. It might smell like kind of off cheese or a smelly foot. And if that's not up your alley, it, it might be indicative that that chemovar isn't really for you either. And again, these are, we're diving into an area that's more anecdotal, far more subjective. Really, we lack that gold standard data to give what I'm saying, um, you know, real substance. But this is the challenge in utilizing a, you know, a medicine that has hundreds of compounds within it rather than one single compound. And, and that's right. The, the, the terpenes themselves don't need to be ingested orally or inhaled to have uh, bioavailability and have an effect within the body. So when you are smelling them, they are actually active within your system, creating creating a noticeable uh, f effect. So it's not just that you like the smell of it; you're actually feeling the the, the the physiological changes within your system that make you feel better. So that can be quite a, a good good way of thinking about it. And and then also with the terpenes as well, they're likely interacting with e with each other, uh, aren't they? So I guess a question I have for you, Cam, is how, how useful are the, the terpene profiles that might come on cannabis products where they're just looking at a limited range of, of terpenes that might be within that product? It's really challenging because, as, as you said, not only are they interacting with their own physiology, they're most likely interacting with themselves and each other to produce uh, effects that we probably don't even have the, the actual capacity to measure. It's almost a job that more suited to artificial intelligence, something that can map out hundreds and hundreds of different mechanisms and pathways at once. But overall, looking at a terpene profile from a plant, it gives you a, a much clearer idea of what it's going to do than if you don't have that terpene profile. Mm -hmm. So if you, um, strains that are high in mercine are going to be your more classic uh, indica chemovars. They're going to be more sedating, um, generally a little bit better for things like nausea, pain, muscle relaxation, tremors, uh, sleep. Mm -hmm. Whereas strains that are high in uh, more uplifting bright terpenes such as pinene or or limonene are going to generally give that more bright uplift uplifting creative mm -hmm. mood elevating experience something that's probably a little bit more functional for um, daytime administration and so really if you're looking at the first five most dominant terpenes within every certificate of analysis those are going to be some solid indicators of what the effects from that plant are going to be and some of them are you know intangible effects and inexorable and difficult to describe and ascertain. However, um, these things are the distinguishers between different chemovars and really, really important that you assess them. Uh, definitely, definitely. It is still important to make sure that you listen to your patient and you listen to the person who's <gasps> having the experience as well because that is a, another valuable piece of information just because it's there in the certificate of analysis of a patient reports that something's making them feel agitated or anxious even though you think that it shouldn't be listen to them because their experience really within this is, is, is what matters. And then just quickly on the terpenes as well. 
um, and and their safety profile. So terpenes in their natural amounts, in the amount that they might be found in the plant or they might be found in, in nature are extremely safe. What about terpenes at, at high doses? Because I do hear worrying reports of people in, in the States using 30%, you know, you know, we talk about 2 2% in the plant, but 30% terpenes in, in dabs and these types of things mm. that, um, that they're then inhaling. And these are powerful, powerful medicines in, in their own right. Do you have anything um, that you'd like to add about that? Yes. Again, for those, for those massive doses, um, I think that uh, th- there's a reason why they're expressed in such small concentrations within the plant. Um, they're very, very powerful molecules. And for a lot of these uh, terpenes in, in these high doses, they can be acutely toxic. Um, they can produce nausea, vomiting, and some pretty severe adverse reactions. So when you hear of people putting 30% terpenes, you know, within a dab, that's simply, you know, far, far above what that uh, plant was kind of intended for. And the same thing goes with, um, you know, terpenes used within, uh, you know, maybe uh, liquid-based vaporizers as well. Terpenes can, once they degrade, potentially have carcinogenic effects um, and some more severe uh, irritational effects within the lungs, uh, even your digestive system. So it's really, you know, a little goes a long way and more is not always better with terpenes. Like all things with cannabis, less is uh, less is often more. Yep. And so I guess just to just to recap, terpenes are aromatic compounds responsible for the unique sense of each plant. Uh, although most evidence is still preclinical, terpenes have been utilized in herbal medicines for thousands of years, and a growing body of research is providing substance to the theory that they contribute heavily to the entourage effect, which is, as you say, the mood of the medicine. Um, terpenes are generally well tolerated, and should be used within the dosages that they are found within the plants simply until we have the evidence to suggest otherwise.